Hello, I'm John Eldridge, and welcome to the Ransomed Heart audio podcast. For more information on Ransomed Heart Ministries, our resources, and events, please visit us online at www.ransomedheart.com. I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. The creation waits in eager expectation for the sons of God to be revealed. We know that the whole creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth. Not only so, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for the redemption of the coming kingdom. For in this hope we were saved. Friends, welcome to the Ransomed Heart podcast. John Eldridge and Craig McConnell beginning a new series. And we'll tell you what it's about in a moment. But I want to set a context for it. Over the years that we have been writing books and holding conferences and podcasting and blogging and putting out audio and video resources, kind of the heart of what we've been trying to do is recover some of the lost treasures of the kingdom and bring them back to the people of God. For example, hearing the voice of God, having a actual, real relationship with Jesus, with your heavenly Father, like you would any other person who has the ability to communicate to you and you to them. I mean, assuming John 10, assuming that my sheep hear my voice, and I mean, Craig, just even that one piece, what difference has that made in your life? No, it changes everything. It changes everything. My understanding, my view of God, my relationship with him, and how I live and kind of the nature and quality of my life. And to live without it? Is unimaginable. Impoverishing. Mm -hmm. You know, when we compare kind of before and after and just the fruit, the, oh my goodness, the Mm. thousands of rescues and the hundreds of thousands of blessings that have come simply by recovering that one treasure assumed by the saints Mm -hmm. for centuries, lost to the church, or recovering the treasure that Jesus Christ came to heal your humanity, that he actually really does heal woundedness, brokenness, that he brings restoration to the human soul. He restores my soul. What difference has that one made? Wholeness, completeness, holiness, maturity. Again, the fruit of the work of Christ in a substantive way in my being results in just a deeper intimacy and adoration with him. And the ability to love others. Yes, yes. I mean, just to just think back on my more unhealed condition, even well into my Christian life, and just the unresolved anger, the fear, the resentment, and, oh, I mean, just the ability to love God with all of your heart, soul, mind, and strength. You, You can't do that very first command unless substantive restoration is taking place. So that that lost treasure. Yes. Yeah. Another lost treasure that uh, I think is really profound in its impact is the major and the minor themes. I mean, there is a major theme in our life, and that major theme being healing, the presence of God, the comfort of God, the gifts of God, the hope of God. Mm. Resurrection. Glory of God. Yes, life. resurrection, life. The minor theme, which is true, a part of our life is pain, 
suffering, loss, angst, all of that. I mean, to acknowledge both are true, but which is major? What difference does that make in your oh, life? Oh, man. I'm just thinking of you can listen to two different types of even worship music. One focuses, you know, on the angst, suffering, longing, not a whole lot there with God. And the other, while acknowledging the suffering, is focusing on breakthrough yes, and intimacy with God and the availability of the kingdom, and resurrection life, yeah. and, you know. And the fruit of that, yeah, massive for me, massive, keeping things in their place, especially when we live in an age that makes the minor theme the major theme. Yeah, yeah. And then there's the category, the treasure of the larger story, just having the perspective of everything fits into a larger story. And to know that, how does that help oh, you. Oh, gosh, the interpretation. This is a fascinating little tidbit from recent weeks. Stacy and the gals were doing a captivating retreat, and I had a role, but a small role in that. So I was home for most of the weekend, and but praying, engaging, supporting, preparing my own heart, praying for the team, the gals, and all that. And I just felt like I needed the story again. I'd lost the story. Life had become petty and mundane and hassles and, you know, bounced checks and stuff that we forgot to get done and family issues. And I literally had to go downstairs and put on one of the Hobbit movies just to kind of capture me back up into, right, right, right. We live in a larger story. There's an epic battle of good and evil. Yes. My choices matter. Right? All of that. Yeah. My prayers matter. The battle matters. Hope matters. It's absolutely huge. Yeah. For me, John, the larger story is I'm, I'm just constantly reminding myself we're in Act 3, mm -hmm. but so much of my longings and hopes and desires are actually Act 4. Yes. And to understand those different acts yeah. is, it informs my living, my interpretation oh, gosh. of – events unfolding. Well, for example, you know, the news feed I was following this morning and at the time of this recording, gang, the uh, schoolgirls in Nigeria mm -hmm. is one of the big issues going on and, you know, close to 300 schoolgirls abducted by a terrorist group and it's been more than a month now and, I mean, I just... Uh, that hasn't been a good month for those girls, mm. I guarantee it, in the hands of evil men uh, who intend to either kill them or ransom them or sell them into the sex trade. You know that those girls are being abused even now. And just reading the news, just following the tragedy of the world, the larger story and Act 3, Act 4, context and hope and just realizing that there is only one thing that is going to bring about lasting change. There is only one answer, and it is the return of Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. There is no other. There isn't. And when we lose that... I think we lose more than we know. And so, friends, that is our subject for a series that we want to talk about, the return of Jesus, what we believe to be the imminent return of Jesus, and why, why that is a lost treasure, why that's just so absolutely crucial. And let me just try and give a, a little bit of context here. I want to read a few scriptures as we begin to dive into this. Paul in Colossians chapter 1 begins his letter to the church by saying this, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, to the holy and faithful brothers in Christ at Colossae. Grace and peace to you from God, our Father, 
We always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you, because we have heard of your faith and of the love you have for all the saints, the faith and the love that spring from the hope that is stored up for you in the kingdom of God and that you've already heard about in the word of truth, the gospel that has come to you. Paul is implying in Colossians 1 that our faith and our love, our ability to live with faith, our ability to live a life of love, are actually fruits of. He said they spring from, like a springboard or like you know the flowers of a tree that's rooted in something else. They spring from hope. And then in 1 Peter chapter 1, the old saint is writing to the church and he says, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil or fade, kept in heaven for you, who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of the salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. In this, you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while you may have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. And then a little bit later in chapter 1, he says, Therefore, prepare your minds for action. Be self-controlled. Set your hope fully on the grace to be given you when Jesus Christ is revealed. Peter in this passage is is assuming that the saints are rejoicing (laughs) in this hope of the imminent return of Jesus and everything that that means to them, for them, right? Mm -hmm. In them. Allow me two more and then I want you to react. Romans 8, I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. The creation waits in eager expectation for the sons of God to be revealed. For the creation was subject to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it in hope that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the glorious freedom of the children of God. We know that the whole creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present moment, and not only so, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for our own redemption. In this hope, we were saved, but hope that is seen is no hope at all. Who hopes for what he already has? But if we hope for what we do not yet have, we wait for it patiently. And then I like how Peterson translates that last verse in the message. He says, but the longer we wait, the larger we become, and the more joyful our expectancy. I'm actually going to pause there and say, joyful expectancy, waiting eagerly, setting our hope fully on it. In this, you greatly rejoice. Is that your experience of most of the believers you know on the imminent return of Jesus Christ? Um, John, just recently you gave a talk on the joy of the coming kingdom, and I remember being there with a group of people and my reaction at that time and many others was one of (gasps) and it was like I felt at that time just fear just kind of dread like no no not no fear dread and I know that what I was feeling was weren't the right responses But there's something that was very disruptive about seeing clearly and facing the truth of the return of Christ. And then 
contrasting my reaction, my internal feelings with what I knew Scripture was saying, it ought to promote in me. So when you ask me reactions, I've experienced them all at different times. But I think for a lot of people, the return of Christ is they feel very ambivalent about it. You know, And isn't that fascinating? It is. Like it's it's bizarre, but prevalent, yes. but, but prevalent. And Craig and I both came to Christ back in the 70s with the Jesus movement. And back in those days, I mean, it's Hal Lindsey, late great planet Earth. Mm-hmm. I mean, it was a big time of prophecy and end time stuff. You just – Keith Green and all that. You couldn't hardly listen to a conference speaker, or, you know, the latest uh, – tract coming out. I mean, it was just all f- excitement, excitement yes. and focus on the imminent return of Christ. And whatever you want to make of that age, what's remarkably different, I mean, the scriptures are talking about, oh, this is actually the reason that you believed in Christ. Oh, this is your salvation. Oh, this is the gospel, yes. right? This is what you are greatly rejoicing in, right? This is what you are waiting eagerly and filled with joyful expectancy. And I just want to go, holy cow, I think we have a lost treasure here. I think that this is another example of something like hearing the voice of God, the ability to break the power Mm -hmm. of spiritual warfare, the healing of the human soul. I mean, this feels like another one of those massive lost treasures because, Craig, that is not how any, save two, maybe one or two, of the Christians I know live like this. You know, that when you bring up, you bring up the return of Christ, you're usually met with a couple of reactions that aren't these not greatly rejoicing, not, you know, kind of some pushback, some... Yeah, pushback, postpone. Let's push this back until the kids are grown. I see them graduate and have their own kids or, right. you know, I'm not ready. There's My life is anchored pretty solidly in this world and there's suffering, pain. Yeah, there's a lot of hardship, but gosh, I know this. And there's fruits, and I think it's going to get better. And don't cut this off yet. Right. Right. (laughs) Right. right? Oh, I mean, you just said so much in that. I mean, yes, I recall we were in a small group with some very dear saints just a couple years ago. Kind of spent the spring together in a small group. And somehow this came up, the return of Christ and the young expectant mother (laughs) – uh-huh. You know, was just talk about pushback. Talk about, you know, I don't want to hear that right now, right? I have my young family to look forward to, you know, and it's either that reaction or the pushback is, oh, eh, wacky. Oh, where's this going to go? Yes. And I just want to point out whatever else, gang, you think of this. I just want to point out. You have this massive body of text in the Old and New Testament that this is actually the centerpiece of your salvation. This is core to your faith. This is the thing you stake everything on. And so, whoa, like what is with the chasm here? What is with the pushback, the dichotomy? I think we have a lost treasure here that could do great good, that could do great, great good. Don, I think uh, when you read the passages in God's Word and and then you consider how the church has understood the return of Christ over the years, it's when we say eminent return of Christ, what we're referring to, I think Scripture's pointing to, is kind of almost a daily sense, a daily comfort, hope, anticipation that Jesus is coming. And oh, what joy that brings. 
It's not something that, yes, eventually will happen. It's personal. It's there. It's one of the qualities and fruits of abiding in Christ is that expectation, and he's coming back at any moment. So I think most of us live with the acknowledgement that that's true, but it's not imminent. Any moment he could come at any moment? In fact, Jesus ends Matthew 24 with some deep exhortation to be ready. And he says, because the Son of Man will come at an hour when you do not expect him. And then he goes on to tell this parable. He says, who then is the faithful and wise servant whom the master has put in charge of the servants in his household to give them their food at the proper time? It will be good for that servant whose master finds him doing so when he returns. I tell you the truth. He will put him in charge of all of his possessions. But suppose that servant is wicked and says to himself, my master is still a long ways away. And then he goes on to describe, you know, he begins to eat and drink and get hammered and mistreat the fellow servants. But you notice what's at the heart of that? Oh, that's still so far away. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I just want to go, yikes, yikes. I think that's crept in. Yes. I see it in me. I see it in my dear ones. Like just this posture in the church of, oh, that? Yes. Oh, that's still so far away. Yes. Well, John, you kind of freaked us out a couple of weeks ago at one of our uh, Ransom Heart just staff meetings. You expressed your belief that he was coming soon. And I think the whole staff was freaking out in fear that you were going to put a date. And we were going from this incredible ministry being used by God to, oh, no, we're in the wacky. And my point there is that we're really frightened by having an eminent sense of him coming. You know, for someone to stand up and say, Jesus is coming soon, there's this part of you that just instantly goes, no, don't go there. Don't say that. We really do push against it. I think for unholy reasons, actually. I know the pushback, but you know what? To be honest, Craig, I don't think that's why the staff was upset. I think the staff was upset because of all the reasons you previously gave word to of, oh, wait, wait, but I've got that special thing coming, my daughter's wedding, our our first grandchild. You know, to be honest, I think really unholy reasons Mm -hmm. was, frankly, the pushback. Now, yes, we fear the wacky and that sort Uh of thing, but... I think what God is trying to reveal gently, lovingly to his people is that, gang, this is central to Christianity. This is core to the New Testament. You're going to have to dismiss an awful lot of scripture to take the posture of the servant that says, oh, not that. I want to go there. That's still so far off. Yikes! Time out! Not not good, not healthy, not helpful, not holy, like an equivalent of, no, God doesn't speak to his people. Mm -hmm. That was for the Bible times, but they're not for now. No, spiritual warfare is a category. Actually, that does not exist. Mm -hmm. Same thing. Mm -hmm. You're dismissing a what was meant to be a treasure that was supposed to do all kinds of wonderful things for your hope and your heart and your suffering and your life and your perspective on things like the 300 schoolgirls abducted and probably systematically raped at this point and the horrors of the world. I mean, this was supposed to be essential. Mm Mm-hmm. And I think our pushback and our rejection is is not something that's helpful, right. good, holy. Yeah. Quick, let me give two quick examples of why I think this is a lost treasure. 
I think we've illustrated that it's lost. <laughs> now I want to try and illustrate why it's, it's a treasure that's been lost. You confessed something that I think is so deep and profound in the church. We're hardly aware of it. When you were talking about your own pushback minutes ago and you were saying, my life is anchored in this world, mm -hmm. which, of course, goes against everything mm -hmm. in the Bible, <laughs> everything. Put it. In the Christian life. My yeah, that's life. right. I'm going to build more barns. I'm going to, I say to myself, self, take it easy. You are, you know, all of that stuff. Do not store up for yourself treasures on earth where moss and rust break through and thieves break in and steal, right? Okay. So I think one of the things that a genuine hope in the beauty, joy, richness, healing, restoration, glory of the return of Jesus, his near return, I think it helps loosen your grip on this world. I think we are all deeply anchored in the world in ways that we're not supposed to be, and then it breaks your heart. That's the danger, yeah. is that that'll break your heart. That will destroy you. And you know what? That'll make you hate God. It really allows in hatred of God because life does not work out the way any of us totally want it to. Bits and pieces, you mm -hmm. betcha. But so much of it falls short of what we had hoped for. You know, that ministry never really gets off the ground. That child never really walks deeply with God. And yes, your friends love and care, but they're so busy and they're taken out by their own battles and trauma and warfare. They're not really present. And you see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Like, this is a rescue. Mm -hmm. This is a treasure because you anchor your heart in trying to make life in this world really what your life is about. It'll break you. It will break you. Yeah. The deepest and truest desires of our heart that we get taste of being fulfilled and enjoyed and touched in this life, by and large go, profoundly fall short of what we yearn. You know, and until we get in touch with our desires and see how deep they are and recognize that much of what I want and long and hope for is yet to come, you know, in the next, in the next act. Mm. I'm going to be anchored in this world. I, mm. Until the next act holds more for me than this, mm. I'm, I'm going for it here, right? Right. And we become angry, desperate, grasping, demanding, fearful. I think it brings a lot of fear into our lives. I mean, on Resurrection Sunday, Easter Sunday, the pastor of the church that we were attending preached this great message on the resurrection, and he was talking about the early Christians and their posture toward death, and Rome was acting like any belligerent totalitarian government, and it was using fear of death to keep all of its citizens in line, so it stationed soldiers in every town. You know, there were garrisons in every province, right, that we will keep you in line through fear. And then this group of Christians comes along and and Roman government says, you know, we're going to kill you if you don't bow to Caesar. We're going to kill you if you don't renounce your faith. And they had never encountered this. The Christians went, so? I love that. So? Big deal. That means nothing. One, you can't kill us because we don't die. We live forever. Secondly, so what? Like, whoa, like the, just the power of that. So I think it's a treasure because it rescues our heart from mm -hmm. so much. Unnecessary fear, mm -hmm. unnecessary worry, unnecessary pain. Frankly, to be honest, unnecessary angst. Yes. Also, I think it's a treasure because it enables us to live more for the kingdom. Like if you really actually thought, come on, gang, let's just be honest. If you really actually thought that Jesus was going to come back in your lifetime sometime in the next, you know, 40, 50 years. If you thought it was going to happen in your lifetime, you'd live differently. I guarantee it. You would. 
And a quick example of that. So first an embarrassing confession and then a great story. The embarrassing confession is I hate talking to people on airplanes. I just do. I am a cocoon. When I get on an airplane, I love that time. A couple hours to read, Mm -hmm. journal, listen to music. And so as soon as I get in my seat, bam, my headphones are on. My book is out, and I send a very loud message (laughs) to those who are sitting by me. Back off. I'm not available, right? This shop is closed, okay? I'm sorry for that. I'm embarrassed by that. I don't think God's in that posture because I have friends who lead people to Christ on airplanes. Really, actually, like I have friends who have phenomenal conversations with people on airplanes, rich, deep, turn them on to great books, you know, share their hope, love. Maybe it's not full-blown evangelism, but phenomenal engagement with human beings, you know. So that's my confession. The beautiful story is on a recent flight to the East Coast, God got me into one of those conversations. Like the woman literally interrupted me as I was putting my headphones on back on us after I'd gone to the bathroom and I'd come back and she stopped and asked me a question about why I was journaling. I had my journal out and it led to a phenomenal conversation about Jesus Christ. Hmm. But here's the deal is I wouldn't have had that conversation had I not the sense of I actually think the hour is late and I think my conversations matter. Hmm. So I'm going to stop being so selfish mm-hmm. <laughs> with my time and I'm going to take that phone call. I'm going to stop with that checker in the in the mm-hmm. grocery store and share a few more words. You know, I'm going to be available on airplanes and not just blow people off. Like, I think the fruit of this is really good. I think the fruit of it shows what a treasure actually has been lost. This isn't an occasion for fear. Right. This is an occasion for dread. This is like... This is like the core of Christianity, (laughs) you know? And so if it is, if it is the core, then I want to ask, what happened? What happened? John, I I just can't help but wonder, those listening in, what is this stirring in you? What's your reaction to what we've been talking about? And what does the thought of the eminent return of Christ, where does that take you? I think that is a really crucial question because it raises all kinds of things in us that we didn't even know were there. Mm -hmm. And for some, it might be utter relief, hope, Mm -hmm. joy. I think for a whole lot of people, they're somewhat unnerved, unsettled. I don't like the subject. I don't, oh, really? We're going to go there? And I think that it's disruptive. And then, Craig, let me go back to a moment that took place. So, yeah, in that director's meeting here at Ransomed Heart weeks ago, I shared my conviction that all of the evidence of the world points to we are in the last days whether it's the unbelievable increase in natural disasters, and Jesus describes all that, or it's the unbelievable suffering of humanity with 27 million slaves and 1 million children taken into the sex trade every year. And, you know, you just, I made my case that I think we are near mm-hmm. the imminent return of Christ. And your reaction was surprising to me. Say a bit more about that, the the dread, the... Yeah, just, um, no, I don't know how his return unfolds. I don't know what that would require of me. I am anchored in this world. I suffer, but I find so much joy, and my life's been so disrupted. I don't need another one. <laughs> I I love your honesty. I love... Uh, You know, it just seems so big. It was so much and and so unknown. And there's just at that time so much ambivalence. Mm. Yep. I think a lot of listeners are there. 
And so, friends, I think we have a treasure for you. I really do. I think this is as beautiful and as valuable as healing of the brokenhearted or learning to hear the voice of God for yourself or just the incredible victory that's available when we shut down the works of the enemy against us. All these other treasures that if you've hung around Ransomed Heart at all, you've tasted some of the goodness of. I think we have something for you here as well. So we're going to try and shed light on this and remove some of the wacky and bizarre and try and get the treasure back. But I want to read from the end of Revelation chapter 22. This is, this is how the Bible wraps up. This is the end. This is the exclamation point that's put on the scriptures that you love. Behold, I am coming soon. My reward is with me, and I will give to everyone according to what he has done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. And he goes on to say, I, Jesus, have sent my angel to give John this testimony for the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David, the bright and morning star. And then the response to this The church then responds, and it says, The Spirit and the bride say, Come, and let him who hears say, Come, whoever is thirsty, let him come, and whoever wishes, let him take the free gift of the water of life. And then down in verse 20, He who testifies to these things says, Yes, I am coming soon. And again, the church responds, Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. And then what feels like a shift, but I don't think it is, the very last verse is, the grace of the Lord Jesus be with God's people. Mm. Amen. Mm. I think there is a grace that is given with this promise, this hope, this, but more than that, with this Maranatha, with this, yeah. yes, yes. Jesus, come. And what intrigues me is the absolute silence and absence of most of the church on that Maranatha. Like, what happened to that? Hmm. Where did that go? Why did this get stolen from us? Pascal says, our imagination so powerfully magnifies time by continual reflection upon it and so diminishes eternity for want of reflection, that we make a nothing of eternity and an eternity of nothing. Mm -hmm. You've been listening to the Ransomed Heart Podcast with John Eldridge, Craig McConnell, opening a series on the return of Christ. And we invite you to join us as we walk through something that I think is going to be surprising, delightful, yeah, Maybe a little unsettling, but really, really good.